The following is a text exchange which occurred between brothers on April 4th, 2021. 12, 12 a.m. Robert Fitzwalter was one of the barons that made King John sign the Magna Carta. His father's name was Walter Fitzrobert, and his son's name was Walter Fitzwalter. That's not how it even works. Walter Fitzrobert's father was Robert Fitzrichard, and his father was Richard Fitzgilbert. That is as far as I could track it. That's also not how it works. Straight from the heartland, this is Things I Text My Brother. Hey folks, and welcome back to another episode of Things I Text My Brother, a series of conversations which have taken place between the Brothers Drew Yard on subjects spanning the neighborhood and the globe, which will hopefully leave you smarter, kinder, and better looking. Today we're going to jump off from that very dramatic reading that you just heard and discuss the topics therein. Maybe we'll talk about Fitzmagic. Maybe we'll talk about patronyms. Maybe we'll talk about Scutage or Martha's Vineyard. But we haven't plotted an exact course because we want you to join us on that journey. That's how it works on things that text my brother. I'm Jeff. This is Brad. Let's talk about our texts. But before we dive into all things Fitzy, we need to take a look back, because even though we're both amongst the foremost experts on these subjects within our own households, there's always room for us to correct our mistakes and learn more. Thus, it's time for ablutions and edification. Well, Brad, nobody's been correcting us lately, but you tell me that you have an edification. So what do you got? If you think back to our episode on Waldenses and Animal Trials, episode 9... Ooh, I'm, I'm thinking back right now. We had talked about turtle doves being excommunicated in Canada. Ooh, yes, we did. And I said I could not find any documentation on why the turtle doves were being excommunicated. Mm -hmm. We had figured it had something to do with eating things, but I still wanted to know. So I looked it up and I was able to find something. Really? This is a first-hand account from Baron Lahontan from May 1687. Do tell. Where he wrote a series of letters. And in this letter, he says, In a word, we eat nothing but waterfowl for 15 days, after which we resolve to declare war against the turtle doves, mm. which are so numerous in Canada that the bishop has been forced to excommunicate them oftener than once upon the account of the damage they do to the product of the earth. Wait, they had been excommunicated oftener than once? That's what it says. Wow. Oftener than once. Which leads me to wonder... Canada geese are something that I have often wanted to excommunicate, maybe even oftener than once. Is there a future in that? I'm not sure about that, but one time I was running and I saw a Canada goose, a Canadian geese, a goose, however you want to say that. Canada goose? Canadian goose? Canada, not Canadian. Canada goose. Yeah. I saw a Canada goose sitting on top of a building. I've never seen that before. Of course, I knew they could do that, but I'd never seen it. And I also saw one in a tree. What building was it sitting on? Right near my office, there is another office building. It was sitting on top of the office building. It would have been cooler if you said it was sitting on the Canadian embassy or something. Well, I'm not sure I've ever seen a Canadian embassy. But when I was looking that up about the turtle doves, I also found a passage from John James Audubon, mm. uh, you know, of, of fame with nature. and Of nature fame. Nature fame. Yes. And he was talking about passenger pigeons, which are extinct now. Mm. In 1813, he was sitting outside watching passenger pigeons fly over, and he estimated that he saw millions per hour, and he sat there for many hours. Where was he sitting? Just outside, someplace. I don't remember where, but he was sitting outside in the United States, someplace. Michigan, I think, maybe. And he saw millions per hour fly overhead. Hmm. And, by, and that was 1813. By 1900, they were all gone. Well, clearly, that would have been during the War of 1812. And that leads me to determine that the War of 1812 is the reason that all the uh, passenger pigeons are gone, correct? I don't know about that, but there were so many of them. Instead of using clay pigeons at fairs and things like that, they just caught actual pigeons and used them in the shooting games, oh. which is terrible, but interesting. It's one of the saddest things I've heard. Yeah, that's awful. Hmm. That's my edification for today. Now we know why the turtle doves were excommunicated. Brilliant. All right, Brother Brad, so a few minutes ago, we had this beautiful reading on the subject of Fitzrichards, Fitzwalters, maybe some other Fitzes that I can't recall. 
what do you have for me today? How are we going to start out this Fitzy conversation? I was reading about the Magna Carta. Yes. Which is actually the Magna Carta Libertatum. Oh. The Great Charter of Freedoms. Oh, I like that. For those of you who don't speak Latin. I don't. Which was signed between the barons of England and King John because they wanted some more rights. It lasted all of two months before Pope (laughs) Innocent III had it annulled. There are actually several Magna Cartas that happened in the ensuing years after uh, 1215 when that first one was signed. Mm -hmm. Even though we talk about how great a document that was and how it's a foundation for English liberties and American liberties and the revolution and everything, it was really only to help the barons pay less taxes, which fits with what happened in the revolution in the United States, if you really think about it. Yeah. So there were several of them. And I was reading the people who signed it. And there were a bunch of people that were like Robert Fitzwalter. There were several. uh, There was a Fitzhubert or Humbert or something too. There were a whole bunch of these Fitzes. But I was just looking up individuals who signed the Magna Carta. And I ran across Robert Fitzwalter. So Robert Fitzwalter has an interesting historical line. As we talked about, Robert Fitzwalter's father was Walter Fitzrobert. Mm -hmm. Walter Fitzrobert's father was Robert Fitzrichard. Mm -hmm. His father was Richard Fitzgilbert. (laughs) And Richard Fitzgilbert's father was Gilbert Brion, who was also known as Giselbert. Giselle? Giselbert Hmm. de Brion. His dad was Geoffrey of Brion. Oh, I like that. His dad was Richard I of Normandy, who was the second Duke of Normandy. The first Duke of Normandy was Rollo, who in past episodes we've talked about Ragnar Lothbrok or Ragnar Harry Breaches, episode yeah. five, for those of you out there listening yeah. um, to all our episodes, episode five. So another connection to a past episode. Yeah, and Rollos are an underrated candy as well. They are an underrated candy. I'm a fan, yeah, and there's not enough of them around. Especially chilled. I can eat a chilled Rollo. Yeah, I'm, I'm a fan of historical Rollos and present day Rollos for sure. But uh, Fitz, of course, is a, is a patronym, and patronyms really came from Anglo-Normans. So the Normans came to England, took over, and Fitz is a Anglicization of fields. Is it? Yes. I did not know that. Yeah. Did you know that at some point Robert Fitzwalter was the Marshal of the Army of God? Army of God and something else. And some other stuff, yeah. Yeah. It was, it was pretty cool. I, I did see that, and I also saw that the character Maid Marian in the Robin Hood series was uh, based loosely on Matilda, one of the daughters of Robert Fitzwalter. Now, was Matilda waltzing? I believe that Matilda was not waltzing. In fact, Matilda mm. was running from King John, which is in one of the stories the reason why Robert Fitzwalter hated King John so much. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I also discovered that this army of God that Robert Fitzwalter was leading, the army of God is also a present day organization, which is on the Department of Homeland Security's domestic terrorist list. I feel like that only makes sense that they would be. Yeah, I don't believe that the two are related or that there uh, is a Fitzwalter at the head of it, although there's probably a Fitz something somewhere in there if it's big enough. Uh, It is a a common patronym. If the army of God wasn't causing so much trouble as domestic terrorists, I think that would also be a heck of a name for a fantasy football team. I could restyle my fantasy football team as the army of God, and uh, I would dare anybody to take that team on, although I'm sure mom would still destroy us just like she always does. There are a lot of trophies sitting on her mantelpiece. Yes, but she hasn't faced the army of God. I did get to speak to Robert Fitzwalter. What? Yes. Apparently, in the National Archives of the United Kingdom, they allow you to speak to individuals from the past. So you can click on a question and no. and a reenactor answers the question as if they're that person. So I spoke to Robert Fitzwalter and asked him about the signing of the Magna Carta. What did he say? Uh, that the king was a jerk, basically, and he wasn't a traitor. That's about all I got out of it. <laughs> yeah, I was actually reading... All about, uh, I was I was on the parliament.uk website, and I was reading all Ooh. about what the Magna Carta, why it was issued, what the backstory was, what it ended up accomplishing. And the Magna Carta ends up being a lot less impressive than I wanted it to be. It really wasn't about the people. It was really about these 25 barons who just wanted more money. Yeah, 
and then it got thrown over like right away. And apparently out of 63 clauses that make up the Magna Carta, only four of them are still valid. And one of those isn't even in total. And so basically there are two clauses from the Magna Carta that still actually have some weight in modern systems of government, I guess. We think of it as this thing that inspired all these other systems of government. So the two phrases that are apparently still useful are, no free man shall be seized, imprisoned, dispossessed, outlawed, exiled or ruined in any way, nor in any way proceeded against except by the lawful judgment of his peers and the law of the land. That's phrase number one. What do you think of that? I believe that sounds like uh, the right to a jury by your peers. And if you live in Lost Dakota, there is no group of peers who can be your jury. Ooh, very, very good interpretation. The other phrase being, to no one will we sell, to no one will we deny or delay right or justice, Ooh. which also seems directly impacting Lost Dakota, if you ask me. Right to a speedy trial. And according to the UK Parliament, the Magna Carta is significant because it's a statement of law that applied to the kings as well as to his subjects. Although the idea of England as a community with the law of the land independent of the will of the king was implicit in custom before 1215, Magna Carta gave this concept its first clear expression in writing. Yeah, it's not as great as it's made out to be. No, it really isn't, and it really wasn't. I guess if you're a bunch of rich guys who don't want to pay your taxes and don't want to house soldiers in your house without giving any permission to house soldiers in your house, mm -hmm. then the Magna Carta might sound like a really good place to start on a con on a declaration of independence. And that's interesting because when I was looking into this, one of the things that caught my eye, and it's, it's very much a tangential subject related to all this, is the subject of the word scootage. Did you come across scootage? I have heard the word scootage before. I don't think that I know the definition, but I know it has, it's related It's related to taxes, is it not? Yeah, so in feudal times, this was a tax that could be paid in lieu of military service. Ah. And of course, as soon as I read that we had these barons that could pay this additional tax in lieu of military service on top of the taxes they were already having to pay for their lands and things. And those raising taxes were the things that made these barons get increasingly sick of King John because essentially they were paying for his war to try and win back the western side of France, blah, blah, blah. But in essence, one of the taxes that these barons were paying was basically a, you know, a get out of the war tax. And that immediately brought to mind the American Civil War, where you could pay for was an amount uh, then of $300, which I, I saw something indicating that that's the equivalent of $5,000 in modern times, which to me does not seem like a high enough amount. But yeah, the scootage thing and the substitution thing from feudal times and the American Civil War, uh, respectively, seem like very similar things. And all of it is similar to what you said about the Magna Carta just being a way for rich people to pay to kind of get things more their way. No, the Magna Carta was them doing against an even richer person, but I digress. I expected there to be places all throughout history, and I'd be curious for listeners to tell me of times that they know. Um, but beyond the, the feudal times with the scootage and uh, the substitute thing in the Civil War, I didn't find a whole lot of things where people were like blatantly offered the opportunity to pay money or to directly elect a replacement. But during the Civil War, you basically, between the ages of 20 and 45 on the uh, Union side, you were drafted and your choices were to either fight or to pay the $300 or to elect a replacement. And that replacement oftentimes was a person who was in a profession that was otherwise exempt or a person that was aged out but could still fight, or quite often it was an immigrant to a person from another country who would fight in your place. I was reading all about that, but one thing I had never heard of is that apparently Abraham Lincoln paid for a guy to go and fight for him. Now, Lincoln was beyond that 20 to 45 age, but because he saw that the North was struggling to get soldiers after the initial recruitment, and by 1863, when they issued this Enrollment Act saying that you could pay this $300 or you could elect a substitute, Lincoln wanted to kind of encourage that behavior. So even though that didn't really apply to him, he was encouraging other people who were not subject to those rules, other people who were older or for whatever reason weren't subject to that, to get their own substitutes so they'd have bonus soldiers. So Abraham Lincoln actually sent out a guy into the streets of Washington, D.C. to find another person, a representative recruit to fight for him. And in doing so, 
they tracked down a guy named Jay Summerfield Staples on Pennsylvania Avenue. And they basically went up to this guy who, as it turned out, had already been a substitute for somebody else earlier in the war, had been briefly involved, caught typhoid fever, and was honorably discharged. He heals up. He goes back to Washington, D.C. He was originally from Pennsylvania, but he goes back to Washington, D.C. He works with his dad in construction. And one day he and his dad are walking down the street and one of Lincoln's representatives comes up to him and says, hey, bro, you want to go fight in place of Abraham Lincoln? He'll give you some money. And Jay Summerfield Staples basically said, hey, dad, you cool with this? And dad said, yeah, sure, whatever. And he goes back and he gets to meet Abraham Lincoln in the White House. Uh, Abraham Lincoln pays him $500 directly and says, I hope you're one of the fortunate ones. And apparently this guy, at least in Civil War terms, was one of the fortunate ones because after swearing that he was entirely sober when he enlisted, he went off. He served as a clerk and a prison guard, came through the war unscathed, and you'd think the story would go well after that. But if, in fact, later on in 1882, he applied for a Civil War pension claiming that he was disabled by his first round of service with his typhoid fever. But all of that information had been lost. So the army denied his pension. And actually, uh, several years later, 1888, he died of a heart attack at the age of 43. So John Summerfield Staples, eventually he is recognized some town in Pennsylvania. I forget which one. Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, maybe is where he was from. There was a plaque placed on a bridge there. And then in 1955, a flood washed away his plaque. And John Summerfield Staples was forgotten by most, except for, you know, who's not going to forget about him, Brad? His family members that started the Staples office supply stores. Yes, them, of course, but also the dozen of listeners to this podcast <laughs> will never forget John Summerfield Staples, the person who went to serve, answered the call of Abraham Lincoln, and went to serve in his stead in a modern day version of something resembling skewtage. To be fair, getting to see Lincoln at the White House really wasn't that big a deal because pretty much anybody could just walk into the White House at that time and just talk to the president. Yeah, and Lincoln wasn't even there half the time. He he rode his horse to his little summer home several miles up the road and, and wouldn't even let himself be protected by bodyguards during the ride. It was a different time, I suppose. It was a different time, wasn't it? Did you ever hear, though, this all got me wondering, did the Confederates do this too? Because... On the northern side, Grover Cleveland did it. George Templeston Strong did it. John D. Rockefeller, you know, took a break from Standard Oil to pay somebody to go fight for him. But were the Confederates doing it? I feel like they needed soldiers more. They had less people to begin with. So they probably just went and fought, right? They're fighting for, um, they, they just had less people. Well, guess what, Brad? Not only did I wonder the answer to that question, I found the answer to that question. Oh, way to go, Jeff. In some North Carolina history blog, the Confederate conscription law did allow for people to have substitutes or to, to pay for replacements. But as you said, they were running out of people. So it got to the point where you know, there, were, there were lots of people taking out ads in newspapers, either to say, I need a substitute or I am offering to be a substitute. And generally down south, you would pay the person, like if you were the wealthy person trying to get out of it, you would pay that person directly and you would pay them exorbitant rates, which a lot of those people would collect and then turn around and pass themselves off as somebody else and do it again. So some of these people got very familiar to the recruiters who were noticing, you just came here last month with a different name and the month before that with a different name. So that was starting to not work. But also they had the problem that at some point the south was really running out of people. So they passed a rule saying, okay, even though you have legally paid somebody to go fight in your stead, you now have to go yourself. Oh, and by the way, we're going to keep the person that you sent instead of you. And some people challenged that rule in North Carolina, apparently, and briefly had that rule reversed. But eventually, I don't know if it was the Confederate Supreme Court who basically ruled, no, we need everybody. So sorry if you paid somebody. Sorry if it was legal, but you're coming. And so is the person that you sent for you. Did you see the amount? Was it more than 5,000 U.S. American dollars? So it's a little bit tricky. I saw that the prices for hiring substitutes in the South reportedly ranged as high as $3,000 in specie and even higher in Confederate currency, which was basically worthless. So that's actually paying the people. In the North, the $300 was if you were paying the government and not sending somebody in your stead because you could do either. You could oh, yes. pay, the, pay the government the 300 or you could or send you somebody could do in that. your stead. Gotcha. So in the South, 
they were paying the people, their replacements, directly incredibly high amounts. But a lot of those people who were coming in and serving as substitutes were quickly um, found to be lacking in terms of they were the wrong age, they were in poor health, they were alcoholic, or they were looking to turn around and leave. And of course, the other soldiers who hadn't been paid to be there didn't like serving next to these people that were essentially mercenaries because they're thinking themselves, oh, why didn't I hold out and get paid $3,000 to be here? So it just created all kinds of problems. On both sides, the replacement soldiers, the substitute soldiers were treated as not reliable and certainly not the type of soldier you'd want next to you as the enemy is approaching. Interesting. Yeah. And all of that comes from me just wondering what in the heck that word skewtage means, which I looked in about five different places to see how you pronounce skewtage. And you put a little hint of a a Y in there, so it's not scootage, it's skewtage. And you don't say, when you look at the word S-C-U-T-A-G-E, initially I thought, ooh, you got to pay scutage. Scutage. And I don't know, I kind of like the word scutage, but nothing gave me anything indicating that scutage is right. I got scootage and scutage. I don't really have anything to add to that conversation, but if they were being paid $3,000 in specie, that was like six years of a soldier's wage in the Northern Army. I know this we were talking about the Confederate Army, but Mm -hmm. you got basically six years wages. I did see another stat that's saying in the North with the draft, and this isn't really directly related to that, but it was saying in 1863 and 1864, and it was something ridiculous, it was only 15% of people who were drafted in the North actually ended up eventually serving in battle. So 85% of the people avoided the war and it listed the ways they avoided the war. Oh, I finally found my notes on this. It listed the ways they avoided the war as running away, finding somebody else to take their place, or paying the commutation fee. So yeah, 750,000 people were drafted in the North in 1863 and 1864, and only about 46,000 of them ever saw battle. I had no idea. That number blew me away. And how many of those 46,000 died? That I don't know, but it was certainly a, a rich man's war and a poor man's fight is the phrase you see most often attached to this. And of course, some of the people who were being paid to go in and fight were also some of the African Americans who had left slavery or in other ways just found their way into the North during this. And it was a financial opportunity for them, uh, but they certainly made up some of the numbers who were going and fighting. Makes sense. Oh, and one other thing, going back to John Summerfield Staples, do you remember who he was, Brad? John Summerfield Staples died when he was like 40 years old. Yes, of a heart attack. And he was also the person that served as the replacement person for President Lincoln. But I just so happened to come across the lineage of John Summerfield Staples, which although it is not quite as complex as that of Robert Fitzwalter, it does somehow sound like a bit of a a tongue teaser anyway. And it goes, John Summerfield Staples had a father named John Long Staples, who had a father named William Staples, who had a brother named Richard R. Staples, who had a son named George Thomas Staples, who had a daughter named Florence Staples, who had a son named George Thomas Decker, who had a son named Edward Thomas Decker. That's not anywhere near as confusing, but it's fun to read off in rapid succession. If we had a list of that for the Fitzwalters, Fitzroberts, Fitzgilberts and such, I can't imagine anybody being able to read through it as cleanly as I just read through that. I certainly couldn't read it that cleanly, but you mentioned that some of his relatives were named Thomas. When I was looking up some different things about names Mm -hmm. in the 1200s in in England, I came across the fact that Thomas started to become a really popular name in Britain after the Normans came to England. Mm -hmm. And it's now the 13th most popular name, I think, in England and the ninth most popular name in the United States. Mm -hmm. But Thomas comes from the Aramaic word for twin. So Judas Thomas was one of the apostles. Uh Uh-huh. Doubting Thomas. And uh, that name was passed on and just became a thing. So I don't know if there were a bunch of twins hmm. for, uh, in France and there weren't as many tw- twins in England before that. And they just started naming all these twins Thomas or if it was the fact that they pushed the Vikings out or the Vikings became Christian and they had a bunch of twins and they named them Thomas. Are they just like the name? I don't know. But Thomas Mayhew founded Martha's Vineyard on Nantucket Island. I've been there. Named it after his daughter, Martha. Oh, yeah. Martha is the great, 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 great grandmother of Taylor Swift. Wow. I knew Martha was trouble when she walked in. Yeah. Yeah. That seems about right. Brad, the important question to come out of all this, though, is have you ever personally known an Englishman named Thomas or any form of Tom? 
I don't know that I personally know any. I have a English friend named Tim, but not Tom. Not good enough. So the whole reason I'm asking you that is so I could tell you of the Englishman named Tom that I know. Actually, <laughs> I don't know if he's English. He could be Scottish. I, I do believe he's he's from the United Kingdom. He was a rugby player. Aren't they all? I, I don't think all the Thomases are rugby players, but I haven't done the research to prove that. He oh. was a rugby player back when I spent a summer interning for the team that was then known as the London Wasps of the Premiership Rugby League. And Tom Evans uh, had been in a boy band. He played for the Wasps when I was writing there that summer. I got to write a profile on him. He had a, a catastrophic injury, I believe, at some point, at least in terms of his sporting career, within a couple of years of me leaving and ceased to play rugby. And then a decade or a decade and a half go by. And wouldn't you know it, I was reading the tabloids, as I often do. And I noticed that Tom Evans, this young gentleman that I once sat in a smelly rugby locker room with was now dating Nicole Scherzinger, one of the singers of the incredible band, The Pussycat Dolls. Is she also related to Martha of Martha's Vineyard? I, I assume so. But again, I haven't researched that, so I can't say for sure. I thought maybe you, by some some miracle of chance, you were going to connect our two stories together about Tom's and Martha's. I think that's really for Tom to do. Maybe Nicole's middle name is Martha or something like that. But next time I run into Tom, when I'm wandering about in Nabitza or wherever it is, I'll, I'll be sure to ask him about that. Will you be waltzing Matilda at the time? If I can learn how in time to do it, I absolutely will. Another name that I came across when I was doing my research around the Robert Fitzwalters and mm -hmm. patronyms and doubting Thomases and Thomas Mayhews, mm -hmm. I ran across the word Nimrod. You know, I know the word Nimrod generally used to call somebody inept or worse. Yeah. But uh, Nimrod was actually a hunter mentioned in Genesis and Exodus. Huh. And the reason it became used to call people basically imbeciles or inept was because yeah. in an episode of Bugs Bunny, Bugs Bunny says to Elmer Fudd, since Elmer Fudd's a hunter, he says, oh, you poor, pathetic Nimrod. And he was just referring to him as a bad hunter. But apparently, small children who watch Bugs Bunny are also not biblical historians and didn't catch the reference. So they just assume Nimrod meant an inept or idiotic type person. So that is why Nimrod became Nimrod. Because of Bugs Bunny. Yeah. That's actually pretty great. Well, from one Nimrod to another, I think we've actually dived about as far into the Fitzes as we're prepared to do so today. But there's one man who we haven't heard from yet on this subject. His name is Father Art. And we're going to ask him some questions. What do you think of bearded quarterback and Harvard graduate Ryan Fitzpatrick? Well, I, I fully enjoy any and all Ivy League players in, in the NFL. I, I like I like to see that. Also, like guys from military academies. Do you know his nickname? No. Fitz Magic. What do you think of that? Well, it's sort of plain, but uh, it, it seems to work for him. Is there anything which you would like to excommunicate oftener than once? Snakes. Snakes. <laughs> Snakes. Every time. How many of the Spice Girls can you name? Well, not not by their real. Name, I, I know their nicknames, Posh and Sporty, and well, I guess that, that's two. <laughs> so. Two, yes. Ginger? No. No, no, nothing there. All right. Two, that's not bad, though. Rolos, discuss. Oh. Well, I don't eat candy anymore, but uh, I'm all for Rolos. Convenient packaging, interesting mix of chocolate and caramel. So I give it a thumbs up. Well, folks, now that we've heard from Father Art, it means that our time together is coming to an end for this episode. We've said just about everything we can say about Scootage, Nicole Scherzinger, Jay Summerfield Staples, Doubting Thomas, Taylor Swift, and Abraham Lincoln. But fear not, just as soon as we can dig back into the archives and find another gem of a text exchange, there'll be another episode coming your way. In the meantime, you can head over to our Instagram page at Things I Text My Brother Podcast to drop us a note about what you like, what you didn't like, or to tell us about something that we got totally wrong. You might even have enough time to go tell a friend 
an enemy, and a total stranger to give us a listen as well. If you manage to do any of that, the fraternity of three yards will be forever grateful. But most importantly, thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. <laughs> oh, that's the straw noise. If they don't call that the straw noise, they should. <laughs> that's all I got for you. Quick, name the names of the rest of the band, the Pussycat Dolls. Tina. Mm-hmm. Sarah. Mm-hmm. Mike. That's correct. Hey, thank you. Excellent. Wow. Now, yes. name all of the Spice Girls, either by their Spice Girls name or their actual names. Three, two, one, go. Well, uh, you've got uh, Baby Spice. Yes. You one. had um, Victoria Beckham. She was what? Spas- Posh Spice? Two for two. Mm, Mel B. Yeah, she was scary, scary. right? Yeah. yeah. And you had Sporty. Yeah, that's Mel C, I think. And then, yeah, Melcy, and then you had Ginger. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah, Jerry, Jerry Hollow. You got them all. Right? Well done. I was not expecting you to know all of the Spice Girls. So you got so Victoria Beckham, Jerry Hollowell, Mel C, Mel B, and who was the uh, what was what's the other girl's name? I wasn't listening this time through. As we got Mel B. Emma Mel C. was Emma was Baby Emma. Spice. Emma, that's the name I didn't know. Yeah. Emma Bunton? Emma Bunton? Yeah, Bunton or Bunting, one of the two. Yeah. But yes. Yeah, I know them much better than Nicole Scherzinger's crew. Same. 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 <laughs>